Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Uh, we're calling it Beating Big Tobacco to the Punch, Regulating Emerging Products Early. And we know this is a pretty hot topic, uh, and the evidence is that about 380 people registered for this call uh, from over 25 states. So uh, there's a lot of interest in this issue. Uh, my name is Jack Nickel, and I work with the Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing. The Center is a project of the American Lung Association in California, and we're also supported by the California Tobacco Control Program. Uh, we assist local coalitions throughout California on their policy campaigns by providing technical assistance, such as policy information, policy materials, community organizing trainings, and campaign strategy sessions. I'll be moderating today's webinar, which is hosted and co-sponsored by Change Lab Solutions, formerly known as Public Health Law and Policy. And for us tobacco control folks, uh, we used to call them TALC, which is the Technical Assistance Legal Center. But under whatever name, they uh, create innovative law and model policies. Uh, Change Lab Solutions' goal is to help communities create safe places to live, nourishing food, and more opportunities to ensure our health. It offers technical assistance in the fields of tobacco control, physical activity, and nutrition. <clears throat> Before introducing the panelists, a few housekeeping details. Uh, we know and appreciate the interest from around the country in this webinar, uh, but for those who are listening from the 25 states outside of California, Please remember that we've designed this webinar for a California audience. And again, throughout the webinar, if you have questions, please use the chat box in the lower left corner to type in your question, and we'll answer as many as possible offline. So to start off with, I'd like to describe what we're going to do today. First, we'd like to introduce or reintroduce you to some of the novel redesigned tobacco products and new nicotine products being marketed by Big Tobacco. We'll describe why they are a problem and how they threaten to undermine the progress we've made in tobacco control. Then we'll offer some policy solutions to minimize the harmful effects of these products, or better yet, eliminate them altogether. And finally, we'll offer organizing tips, talking points, and tactical suggestions which can help you if you're considering taking up this challenge. Now, what is this challenge? Uh, we want to encourage you to seize the time to lead your cities and counties towards new regulations on these products. Time is of the essence. If we're going to beat big tobacco to the punch, we have to start now. Now, as you listen to our speakers, I hope you keep a couple of ideas in mind. First, our movement, locally, nationally, and internationally, has kept the tobacco industry on the defensive for the last 40-some years. Higher taxes, secondhand smoke regulations, warning, labor, warning labels, advertising bans, and much, much more have kept them on the defensive. Over the same time, the industry has been working to get around our policy successes. They have deliberately created these new products, and are marketing them to nullify our victories. This is their turnaround strategy, and we have to stop it. If these products gain a foothold, if they remain untaxed and unregulated, we will find ourselves on the defensive for the first time in a long time. And that means we'll be fighting to sustain our past gains rather than advancing our public health goals. It is imperative that we take on these products now, get ahead of the industry, and keep them on the defensive. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Matthew Moore. Matthew is a staff attorney at Change Lab Solutions, specializing in legal issues involving tobacco product use and exposure to secondhand smoke. He's a graduate of Northeastern University School of Law and received his master's in public health from Tufts University School of Medicine. He also holds a master's degree in cultural anthropology from San Francisco State University. Matthew will discuss why these new tobacco products are a problem and how they can impact our public health strategy. Matthew? Thanks, Jack. Um, good morning, everyone. 
before I, I get into the, the nitty-gritty of, um, of the presentation, I, I do have a quick announcement that I'd like to make. Uh, for those of you who are coming to San Francisco this fall for the APHA's annual meeting, I'd like to um, let you know that we're having a cocktail reception right around the corner from the conference center. And um, you know, please drop in and, and see us um, anytime between 4 and 7 p.m. That's going to be Monday, October 29th. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be doing a screening of the PBS documentary Designing Healthy Communities. That's um, that's hosted by Dr. Richard Jackson. He's um, a member of our of our of our board. Um, if you're on Twitter um, on this slide, we've got our, our hashtag Twist for Health. Um, so we, we hope to see you there. So having gotten that out of the way, um, what I'm going to be talking about today as part of this webinar is really framing the problem. Um, I'm going to talk about emerging products, what they are, and how they uh, represent a, a potential public health issue. So essentially, the world we're in now is one where smoking is becoming less and less accepted. Uh, Big, tobacco, Big Tobacco understands that, that in order to keep their relevance, they've got to find out, they've got to branch out and find new products that they can use to hook new users and to maintain uh, or re retain current users. So here's a quote from R.J. Reynolds' CEO um, from earlier this year um, that talks about their, their long-term strategy. Now I've highlighted uh, a couple of, of key points here. So in line with our long-term strategy to transform the tobacco industry and reduce the harm caused by smoking, our companies have been hard at work on developing a pipeline of new smokeless and other product innovation. Now the reason why I highlighted these particular pieces is to illustrate what's actually being said here. Big Tobacco is admitting that it is their strategy to ally themselves with the harm reduction movement um, with their new products. So this, this is huge. This says a lot about um, the direction that they're going to go and the marketing strategies that they're going to use for their new products and how they're going to position those new products within the market. So about the products themselves, uh, for our purposes, we're really just going to talk about two categories. Now these are sort of arbitrary categories, products containing tobacco and then nicotine-only products, but it, it actually does help to think of them in these terms when talking about the legal parameters of how they're regulated. So the first of these categories, products containing tobacco, um, here are some examples. Uh, the, the first sort of subcategory that I would say would be dissolvable tobacco. So you see here uh, sticks, orbs, strips, we've got um, uh, lozenges, etc. So these are products that, that contain actual tobacco leaf. Uh, they're flavored in a, in a wide variety of candy-like flavors, and they're available in all these different shapes and sizes under many different brand names. Well, not all of these are available in, in California. Some of them are being test marketed in, in several cities around the country. Um, many, if not most, of these are, are probably going to be available soon nationwide. Um, Another example are what's called snus. Some of you may already be familiar with these. Um, they originated in Sweden. Uh, they're little pouches of smokeless tobacco that the user will, will put between um, their lip and their gum. Um, and, and they've really taken off in popularity. Now they're sold widely throughout the country and throughout California uh, with many different brand names, flavors, etc. Uh, and here's actually a new brand of, of, of smokeless products um, produced by R.J. Reynolds. They're adding these to their line of camel dissolvables and snus under a new name. Um, it's called Viceroy. Um, these aren't yet on the market in California. It's, it's likely that they will be at some point in the relatively near future. So these really are taking off in popularity. Uh, the next 
category are the nicotine-only products. And um, these are products that they don't actually contain tobacco leaf, but they contain nicotine of some sort, either um, you know, extracted, most commonly extracted from, from tobacco leaves, in some cases produced synthetically, although I think um, in, that, in, in those cases it tends to be prohibitively expensive. It's generally cheaper to extract it from, from actual tobacco leaves. The most Sorry, having trouble with slides here. The most common uh, or the most familiar type of nicotine-only product uh, that most of you have probably seen at one point or heard about are e-cigarettes. Um, the market for e-cigarettes has actually been rapidly expanding. I know a lot of people really think that these are just sort of a fad, um, but they're becoming increasingly popular um, really at an exponential rate. Now, part of the reason for this Oh, my slides aren't progressing here. Here we go. Part of the reason for this is that Big Tobacco, which up until recently was competing with e-cigarette manufacturers, has decided that, well, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. So uh, e-cigarette companies are being acquired left and right by tobacco companies. For example, Lorillard just bought the only domestic e-cigarette company, which is called Blue, um, and other tobacco companies have decided to develop their own e-cigarettes in-house. For example, R.J. Reynolds is doing this um, with their new Views brand um, that, that was just announced. Um, you see a picture of that on the top of the slide there. It's actually that's the only picture we could find. That's how new it is. Um, now, th these products at one point were only available in um, you know, mall kiosks or online. They're actually uh, widely available now in convenience stores, pretty much everywhere you go. Um, you know, the prices have come way down. There's, there's uh, a multiplicity of manufacturers out there, not only in China, but also now in the U.S. Um, and, and Big Tobacco's involvement really does mean that there's a huge increase in budgets for e-cigarette marketing. Um, for example, uh, they've got e-cigarette sales contracts that we know of worth half, half a billion dollars, or, or excuse me, half a million retailers already. Um, so it, it really is imminent to see an, a new boom in sales for these, for these products, um, you know, above and beyond the boom that we're already seeing. Another thing to note is that these are often um, uh, kept at the counter. So you can see from the packaging that these don't have to be behind the counter like, like other tobacco products because they don't contain actual tobacco leaves. So they're not subject to the same laws about self-service displays. Here's another new product. This is called Verve. Um, it's currently being test marketed in Virginia. It's, it's a nicotine only uh, product. It's a lozenge. It's, it's um, not dissolvable. And the user will just suck on it for about half an hour or so and then spit it out once the nicotine has been extracted um, from it. So it's, it's made by Altria, although um, Altria's brand isn't actually on the, the packaging. It calls itself Newmark um, rather than Altria or Philip Morris. Another direction that that is um, that big tobacco is taking is to produce cessation products. So nicotine gum, for example, it's not a new product, but it is new that the tobacco industry is producing this directly. Um, the R. J. Reynolds owns what's uh, called uh, Niconovum, which was which has just introduced an FDA approved nicotine gum marketed for cessation products. So it's called Zonic. You see it here. Um, now, of course, Zonic doesn't mention R.J. Reynolds because presumably they don't want people to know that not only is, is uh, their company in the business of getting people addicted, but it's also in the business of selling people um, the, the treatment for that addiction. So in, in addition to the emerging products that are actually um, being test marketed or that are already on the market, there are... Um, a lot of products in development. So all tobacco companies are, are at one point or another working on new products. For example, Philip Morris has announced three new products that, that are in development, um, one of which would actually heat tobacco uh, to be inhaled. It, actually, it doesn't actually burn. There's no combustion. Um, 
and that one's ready for clinical testing. Manufacturing would start, and they estimate, in three to four years. Another one would actually be lit with a normal lighter, and a third one um, uses a chemical reaction that would create an aerosol containing nicotine that, that the user could inhale. Um, and so these are just sort of ideas about the different directions that these emerging products are going to be going in in the next few years. The, the, the question to be asked then, now that we've talked about what these products are, is you know, what are the potential public health risks associated with them? Uh, it's really common to hear people argue that, that these products should be encouraged, that, they're, that because they're uh, supposedly less harmful than conventional cigarettes, that, that they're a step in the right direction. Well, the first thing is we don't actually know for sure that they're less harmful, um, that they, there haven't been enough studies done. But even assuming, for the sake of argument, that they were less harmful, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're safe, right? There is a difference between safe and just comparatively less harmful than cigarettes. So what are the, what are the potential um, public health impact of, of these products? Well, you know, first, these products create a bridge for current smokers to, um, to extend or to, to postpone quitting. Um, essentially what they do is provide people with an opportunity to get their nicotine fix in places where they wouldn't otherwise be able to smoke. So for example, um, you know, airplanes, office buildings, etc. people could actually just carry these products around and use them um, until they can actually get outside and, and, and get to where they can smoke. Um, in case you don't believe me, here's some actual marketing, uh, real marketing, magazine ads, that are marketed at or that are targeted at current smokers. Um, these are for for e-cigarettes and smokeless tobacco. Basically, very upfront about well, why quit? You can use this other alternative product instead. Um, another potential impact is that many of these products are very attractive to youth. Um, that that they can get kids hooked on nicotine and um, you know be lifelong consumers for tobacco products. Um, many of these products are packaged like candy, they're flavored like candy, they're really designed, the way that they're designed is actually very attractive to youth. Um, in the case of e-cigarettes, um, there, there's a whole different array of potential problems. Uh, many, many, if not most, e-cigarettes are actually manufactured abroad. They're uh, for in large part untested or, or not thoroughly tested. And the, the evidence that we do have uh, is that they, they contain several um, substances that are known to be hazardous to human health. Um, and you know, this, this, is, um, this has been recognized by the FDA. You know, they've tested some and, and discovered that there's, um, there's all kinds of materials in them. Uh, not only that, but there's actually a secondhand byproduct. Unlike many of these other smokeless products, there's actually a vapor that's exhaled by the user that others who are in the room might be exposed to. In the case of, of some of these products, um, dissolvables, for example, um, they represent a risk to, to children. Um, poisoning is, um, is something, well, let me back up for a second. Nicotine in and of itself is toxic in sufficient quantities in a large enough dose. In cases where you have products that are indistinguishable in large part from candy, um, you know, it's possible for, for children who can't tell the difference to overdose on these materials, provided that they actually have access to them. So that's, that's another risk. Um, overall, there, there really is little, too little research on the physiological effects, particularly long term, of these new products. And at the moment, it's really unclear what kind of oversight FDA is going to exert over these products. Now, they do have the authority to exert jurisdiction, but so far they, they've chosen not to. Uh, so e-cigarettes, uh, even cigars, little cigars, the dissolvables that I mentioned, um, these are all products that, that currently the FDA has not taken any action on. And this, this gap, um, this lack of regulation, um, it really does need to be taken seriously. So here's a slide that, that you know, the, these are smoked products. These are little cigars that are flavored and individually packaged. The reason why I'm showing you these is to illustrate what happens when there is a lack of, of, um, of regulation. So as many of you probably know, there are, there are new laws that um, prohibit flavored cigarettes and that prohibit individually packaged cigarettes. 
the response by Big Tobacco was to alter existing cigarettes just enough so that they could be legally classified as cigars to provide all kinds of new flavors. Remember, flavored cigarettes are illegal, but flavored cigars are not. And then to make them really cheap and to package them individually, um, meaning that, that youth will, will be able to afford them. You see here 69 cents uh, for, for one. The result was that youth skyrocketed um, and they, these new products completely filled that gap left by the flavored cigarettes that were removed from the market. Now that they're actually well established, there's a toehold in the market, it's extremely difficult to regulate them. Retailer associations have banded together to oppose any regulation efforts, and it's really difficult to, to regulate them after the fact now that the market is so established. So to avoid this problem for a new emerging product, the solution is to actually regulate it early before there's a chance for it to become a, a substantial public health problem. And so um, that's, that's really the next part of our presentation that my colleague Catherine is going to talk about. Um, and, and so before I turn it back over to Jack, who's going to, to um, introduce Catherine, I do have a quick poll question for everyone here. So which of the following tobacco products have you seen sold in your community? So you can select more than one. Um, you know, if you've seen all of the above, you can select all of the above. Or if you've seen none of them, go ahead and click none of the above. Wow, look at those results. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> They're everywhere. Do you want to comment on this, uh, the results, Matthew? Sure. I, I'm actually, um, you know, it, it, it does show how particularly e-cigarettes have really taken a hold in communities. When you, when you look at the number of people that have seen e-cigarettes now where just a year ago, I mean, a lot of us had never even heard of them. It seemed really exotic. And now, um, you know, a, a good chunk of people have seen these in their communities. You know, not only you see 100 over 100 people saying all of the above, also 100 people saying e-cigarettes, um, snus also getting really, um, becoming really ingrained. Dissolvable products, not so much, but I, I think that they're, they're going to take off too. Right. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Matthew. Now let our next speaker is uh, Catherine Mungin. Catherine Mungin is a staff attorney at Change Lab Solutions focusing on tobacco control. She specializes in legal issues that affect the sale of tobacco and the retail environment. Catherine's a magna cum laude graduate of Colby College and received her law degree from UC Berkeley School of Law. Catherine's going to discuss the policy strategies open to advocates to bring these new products under control or ban them entirely. Catherine? Thanks, Jack. Um, my name is Catherine Mungin. I am a staff attorney with Change Lab Solutions. And those of you who know me might notice that I have a little bit of a head cold today. So I apologize in advance if I start coughing at any point. But um, on the bright side, at least you guys are all safe um, from my germs listening to this webinar. So as Jack said, I'm going to discuss some of the policy strategies involved with regulating these products that Matthew just introduced us to. And um, I'm only going to be able to talk about a few of the strategies, but um, please know that you know, there are other options out there. So if your community is interested in policy strategies, uh, don't hesitate to contact us for more information. So the first and possibly the simplest option is to uh, uh, use careful definitions to make sure that these products that Matthew talked about are included in the definition of tobacco product uh, in your ordinance. Uh, 
The definition of tobacco product can cover not just what we think of normally, cigarettes, cigars, smokeless, but also the non-traditional tobacco products like the dissolvables, um, and also these tobacco-derived nicotine-only products like e-cigarettes uh, and the lozenges. Back in 2008, Change Lab Solutions amended the definition of tobacco product in our model ordinances to include any product containing biologically active amounts of nicotine, but not including any cessation product that has been approved by the U.S. FDA. Uh, so that, that really guarantees that you're capturing the broadest array of products possible, um, but still carving out that exception for products that have been approved by the FDA for cessation purposes. Um, and I just wanted to mention that uh, you can do similar things with the definition of smoking uh, in some of your smoke-free ordinances. So many of our models uh, have a definition of smoking that is broad enough to include the use of uh, both e-cigarettes and things like hookah. So um, definitions are pretty powerful um, and really uh, uh, an easy uh, amendment, uh, at least legally speaking, to an ordinance to make sure that we're covering these new and emerging, emerging products. Um, the next strategy is tobacco retailer licensing. Uh, as I said before, just changing the definition of tobacco product in the tobacco retailer licensing ordinance can make sure that these products should be licensed as well. And you obviously get all the same benefits we talk about with retailer licensing, including comprehensive local enforcement programs and the self-financing program through the fees that are collected uh, with the licensing. And the next strategy are age restrictions. So we all know, I think, that you have to be 18 years or older to purchase most tobacco products. Uh, but this isn't necessarily true for some of these nicotine-only products and other products that aren't regulated by the FDA. There's actually no federal law uh, restricting the age to purchase e-cigarettes. Um, you might have seen on some of those ads that Matthew showed us just a little while ago that many of the packages or advertisements say 18+. plus. But this is really, uh, in most places, a voluntary policy. In, in many instances, retailers aren't really obligated to comply with that, and there's no accountability. Uh, there are a few states that have passed laws. So you can see on this map California, Colorado, Minnesota, Tennessee, New Jersey, and New Hampshire all have state laws that say you must be 18 or older to purchase e-cigarettes. There are also a few counties in New York and Washington that have restricted e-cigarette purchases to adults only. Uh, but local and state laws could go further not only to cover e-cigarettes, but some of these other products as well. So that's one option. Another option is restricting pack size. This is a strategy that uh, has gotten some traction with little cigars. Uh, we all know that the Federal Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act required all cigarettes to be sold in packs of 20, but these restrictions don't apply to little cigars right now. So, so little cigars, little cigarillos, things like Swisher Sweets can be sold individually. Um, Matthew showed us that slide at the 69 cent Swisher Sweet earlier. They can also be sold in really small packs. So um, some communities like Boston, Baltimore, and some cities in uh, Los Angeles County have created restrictions against these small pack sizes or individual cigars in order to really reduce access to use. In that same vein, you can also put restrictions on flavored products. Uh, we all know that flavor products attract kids. It certainly makes it easier for kids to start uh, using tobacco or nicotine products. And restricting flavors might reduce the interest kids have in using these. Uh, states, the state of Maine, the city of New York, and the city of Providence, uh, as well as the county of Santa Clara, have all uh, created restrictions on the sale of flavored little cigars, and some of these restrictions extend to other tobacco products as well. You could easily envision a similar restriction applying to e-cigarettes.
Uh, these right here are refillable e-cigarette cartridges. And you can see that they're sold in a variety of flavors, uh, not just tobacco flavor, but fruit flavor, drink flavor, which, by the way, includes some alcoholic drink flavors, and food flavors. Um, and these contain just flavored nicotine. Um, so communities could definitely uh, ban these products or place more stringent restrictions on them to uh, ensure that, that youth are protected. Another strategy is uniform taxation. We all know that these products are not taxed the same way as cigarettes. Um, here we have an example from California. On the bottom you see the Marbell package, which has the tax stamp, which is required for the sale of all cigarettes. And it retails for about $6. In comparison, you have a pack of 20 cigars. Uh, these are, I think, little cigars. They're just labeled as cigars. They're cherry flavored. And they retail for about $1.50 because of the a uh, huge difference in tax rates. So uh, taxing is something that communities might want to look into. On the state level, uh, state governments can certainly create uh, some more uniformity in their tax rate rules uh, compared when you compare cigarettes to other tobacco products. Uh, local taxes are a little trickier. Some communities might be preempted by state law. In California, local cigarette taxes aren't allowed. But it's something uh, you might want to look into and get more legal information about the jurisdiction you're in. Another option is to ban sampling. Um, we all know that sampling is a really popular strategy by the tobacco industry to get people interested and started. Uh, as an anecdote, I was in the mall the other day, and I walked by an e-cigarette kiosk. And I kind of did a double take, and I'm really interested in looking at these things now. And uh, the woman working at the kiosk saw that I was interested and asked me if I wanted to try a free sample. Uh, I was honestly a little horrified. This kiosk was right outside of a jewelry store called Claire's where there are a lot of young people shopping, and people were using these products right there inside the mall. Um, so this might be something that your community is concerned about, and banning sampling uh, would be a, a strategy to help address that. On a related note, you can think about restricting use in public places. Uh, this is a particularly successful strategy with e-cigarettes because there are strong public health arguments in favor. As Matthew mentioned earlier, there are drifting vapors, and these vapors haven't been proven safe yet. There's actually a lot of unknowns about what the vapors contain. Um, there's also the danger of eroding that social norm change. Uh, I've grown up in a generation where it's not common to see people smoking inside, and seeing people using e-cigarettes is a little confusing, to be honest. And we also maybe don't want kids seeing um, the use of these products. This is a collage of some celebrities using e-cigarettes in public places, like parks, um, restaurants, patios. Um, some of these places it's probably illegal to smoke a cigarette, but the law doesn't address e-cigarettes right now. So as I mentioned earlier, this is really an issue of looking at your definitions carefully and checking to see what they cover uh, and making sure that they cover the products you want them to. As always, please visit our red website to get more resources. We have resources on electronic cigarettes and some of our other model policies like tobacco retailer licensing, sampling, and smoke-free areas. Um, and don't hesitate to call us or email us with questions that you have uh, about any of the strategies that we discussed today. All right, at this point I'm going to turn it back over to Jack. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. You know, there's just, you've just said that there's a whole lot of tools we have at our disposal to go after these products. And uh, now our next speaker is going to talk about how to actually do it. Uh, our, our final speaker is Vanessa Marvin. And Vanessa is the director of the American Lung Association's Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing. In addition to managing the center, she provides technical assistance and training to local projects and coalitions throughout California on the development of their policy campaigns and organizing strategies.
She received a BS degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from Yale University. And Vanessa will talk about cities that have specific organizing opportunities right now. Also about talking points and challenges facing our work on this issue. Vanessa? Great. Thanks, Jack. So now that, you know, as Jack said, now that we've talked about the problem and the policy solutions that can be used, we're really going to talk about how to tackle this issue from an organizing perspective. And again, we're really focusing on kind of thinking about this at the local level, because um, as Matthew sort of hinted at, you know, we can't really expect the FDA to take action on these products. You know, they do have a process for looking at new and emerging products, but we expect that process to take a long time. Um, you know, and there's you know, very powerful interest in the tobacco industry at the national level. So we really are looking towards all of you guys at the local and state level to really take action on these emerging products. You guys can be more nimble and adapt to these new and changing issues. But you know, we obviously we want to be realistic. We realize that most of you guys have probably grants um, that you guys are already working on and scopes of work that you're beholden to. So you can't simply go and change your current work plan to suddenly tackle these issues. So, um, and especially since here, you know, our primary audience is those of you guys here in California, and we know that we have some other retail priorities looming in the next year or so with our work plans and our surveys and things like that. But we did want to talk a little bit today about some ways that you can take action to deal with these products right away. So the first thing, um, the first way you can really take action em immediately with emerging products is if you have one of those cities that has a tobacco retailer licensing ordinance whose definition covers all nicotine products. And as Catherine mentioned, this is a, means that any store selling nicotine product would have to get a license. And so. There, this is already in the model language that Change Lab Solutions has developed, and so many cities have adopted this language as part of their ordinance already, and probably without many of you guys realizing it. So here at the Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing, we actually did some research and went and looked at the ordinances that are already on the books, and we found that there are 21 cities here in California. We didn't look for the rest of you guys in the rest of the country. We just looked in California. We found 21 cities that have this ordinance already. Um, and this language in their retail licensing. And so you can see the list of that here. So this is a really great opportunity for those of you guys in these cities to start to deal with these new products right away without needing to pass a new ordinance at all. So we assume that in these cities, no one actually knows about these policies. So with that assumption, um, here are a couple of ideas for you to, to work with your cities to get them in compliance. Obviously, first of all, you should talk to the enforcement folks in your community about what this means. You want to make sure they are looking for nicotine products, not just cigarettes and their inspections of stores. And then you know, this might take some extra education and training on your part to help them understand what the law means and what these products are um, so that they're understanding what they're looking for. And along these lines, you should also have a conversation with your city attorney, your county council, about this language and make sure that you both understand and have the same interpretation of the language that any store selling any of these new and emerging products with nicotine should be getting a license even if they're not selling to cigarettes. And then you should also talk to your coalition about it. You want to make sure you, they may know of other locations in the city that should be getting a license because they have this definition um, but that maybe don't have a license right now. So this might be the case if a store was not selling uh, cigarettes, but was selling maybe e-cigarettes, like we have seen a lot of the kiosks and malls, for example. So they should be getting a license. So another way that you can take immediate action to deal with these emerging products is if you're already working on a tobacco retailer licensing ordinance in your community. And if that's the case, you can make sure this definition is, stays in the language, that you get the model language from Change Lab Solutions, and make sure that the ordinance covers all nicotine products. So that'll encompass e-cigarettes and all the other products. And then if you're working on licensing, as I know many of you guys here in California are, you can include some provisions in your ordinance to deal with these products. So many of you guys in California have heard about how you can you know, plug in various um, additional aspects to a uh, tobacco retail licensing ordinance. Um, and Catherine outlined a bunch of different ideas of ways you can do that to deal with these new products. So you know, banning the display of the products, or the sampling of the products, in your licensing ordinance. Um, and this is the way, you know, uh, Matthew talked about the little cigars and cigarillos, which were kind of the last emerging products 
that's the way a lot of cities are starting to deal with those emerging products, is including them as a restriction in their licensing ordinance. So that's a, definitely a way you can deal with uh, these, these new emerging products. Obviously, if you've got the political will and the ability in your community to do them as a standalone ordinance, you can definitely do that. But again, since many of you guys have restricted work plans, kind of including it in a licensing ordinance as a way to do something now about these emerging products. And then lastly, uh, another way to start doing something about these emerging products immediately is to start including them in your youth purchase surveys or other retail surveys that you conduct in your community going forward. For everyone in California, this means we have a huge opportunity with the retail surveys we're going to be doing next summer. Um, so just making sure you're including this um, and that way maybe you can include it as, uh, as part of your work plan moving forward. So those are some practical ways to work on the issue now. We're, now we're going to switch gears a little bit to talk about some organizing considerations and talking points and things like that. And we're going to start with a poll question, which is it legal, legal to sell FDA approved cessation products with nicotine to minors under 18? So it looks like we have leaning towards fall, but pretty split. All right. Well, this is actually a trick question. <laughs> so um, it is legal to sell FDA-approved cessation devices to minors, but you cannot sell it over the counter. It needs to be done with doctor's approval. So. Sort of a trick question. I guess everybody got it right or everybody got it wrong. Who knows? So, um, so I'm going to come back to this, but um, this is just one of those things to think about when you're in our talking points. We're going to come back to it. So when we're working on restricting the sale of these products in your community, there are a couple challenges that we wanted to talk about here on this call. So. As you guys know, when we're working on other issues, for example, if we're working just on tobacco retail licensing or on smoke-free outdoor areas, our rule of thumb for organizing is to make sure we demonstrate to the elected officials what the problem is. You know, what's the public health harm? What's the damage? Who is it, being, who is it affecting in our community? We show them the high rate of sales to youth. We bring in advocates to talk about how the secondhand smoke is affecting them. All of that sort of thing is kind of common how we work on and tobacco control issues. So a problem with you know, working on these new emerging products is that in many cases these aren't on the market as we went back, you know, going back to the, the poll that Matthew did, you know, a lot of places some of these products aren't even on the market. So you can't point to the stores that are selling these dangerous products and they aren't really technically harming anyone in your community yet. Um, so it's going to be a lot, you know, it's going to be hard when you're working with elected officials and meeting with them and talking to them about this issue, asking them to set aside, you know, other important issues that they're working with and dealing with in your community to work on something that isn't even a problem yet in their community, that they're, that's not even there um, affecting their community members. I mean, obviously with the little cigars and e-cigarettes we are seeing that, but with a lot of the new products they haven't even moved into some of the markets. Um, across the country and into California in particular. So obviously there are good arguments to be made, you know, that Matthew went through about why these products have a potential to be harmful. Um, and it's again, it's just really smart for city council members to regulate this product before it comes in their community. And the benefit is that there's no retailers selling this. You know, we've seen great opposition to some of our other licensing and retail um, environment policies. So um, regulating a product that's not there and that no retailers have a stake in um, will make it a little bit easier, hopefully, for the, the city council to take action. But really, what it really just means is that you need to be a little more creative and a little more persuasive in explaining to the elected officials about why they need to work on these products. So another kind of challenge moving forward and topic that's going to be tough to navigate with these new products is the issue of harm reduction. And I put an image of a syringe up here just because that's the most common type of harm reduction strategies that we all know about are needle exchange programs. But in tobacco control when we talk about harm reduction, we're often talking about allowing people to continue to smoke, 
but letting, having them switch to less harmful cigarettes or to less harmful products like you know, the smokeless products, the e-cigarettes that don't harm the user as much as regular cigarettes. So as we begin to work on these new products, we can expect people to say, you know, why are you trying to stop people from using these products? At least they're not smoking a cigarette. Um, and this is going to be even more true with those products that Matthew pointed out where they don't even contain tobacco and they might look like they're cessation products. And I know we've all heard you know, e-cigarettes being talked about as cessation devices or helping people quit smoking, that sort of thing. You know, and the tobacco industry knows that this argument is persuasive. They're using it um, in the way that they talk about these products and the way that they market these products. And then the argument is also going to come from our allies in public health and from um, elected officials who are going to feel like simply making life better for smokers is helpful. You know, it's one less cigarette that they're smoking. But you and I know that by keeping people on these less harmful products, it's preventing smokers from quitting. It undermines our efforts with every tobacco tax and every secondhand smoke where our ultimate goal is to persuade people to quit. And so in the long run, allowing this harm reduction products and this harm reduction message um, to, to be out there is going to undermine our public health gains and the social norm changes that we're trying to make. And so the tobacco industry knows it. And so we need to be aware of it and um, be countering it as we're moving forward. So again, just to review some of the, the messaging that will help you counter this, um, that Matthew touched on most of these, but just talking again, that you're talking to elected officials about why these issues are important in your community um, and why they need to do something about it now. And one of the big ones is just that you know, there are already regulations out there. You know, we've seen some of the other states are starting to tackle some of these products. Um, the, you know, the poll question was about the FDA um, and their restrictions of sales of products to those under 18. And that's just an important message point to kind of remember is that you know, the cessation devices aren't even freely sold that have, um, you know, aren't even freely sold to those under 18. So why should these products be? And we know that other products are you know, restricted in sales to minors. So there is kind of a trend and, um, about you know, restricting sales to minors with all of these products. So I think that's a good angle when you're talking to city council members. And especially because we know, again, that many of these products have flavors, um, which is going to be appealing to youth. And again, they're bridge products. Um, so if you have a city, um, that has a strong secondhand smoke ordinance that they are proud of, that they've been working on. Um, you can work with the city council and really point out how um, allowing people to use these products and having these products sold is really going to undermine the work that they've been doing and the good steps that they've taken in the city um, to persuade people to quit smoking. So you're going to allow people to stay hooked when they might otherwise have quit because of the, the good social norm um, policies you've passed. Um, remind elected officials that even if they don't know um, the exact harm of many of these products, that um, we don't know that they're good for people or that they're any less bad, that they're completely untested and unregulated, and so you know, that they have a chance in their community to take a step um, to protect their residents. Um, and then also just, you know, I think it's going to be important when we talk about the harm reduction argument that we just remind elected officials that these are not FDA-approved cessation devices, that we are totally fine with um, FDA-approved cessation devices, um, but that making these health claims or harm reduction claims is totally inappropriate, um, and we're just going to have to make sure we educate our elected officials about that. And then I think, again, just reminding the elected officials that um, you know, they may feel like we should just let FDA take action or let national take action, um, that, you know, that there is um, a real trend and a real um, a need for us to take action locally to protect our residents uh, because we can't wait for FDA. We don't know how long that might take. And then in terms of um, community organizing, again, just we have to say and have to remind everyone that, again, these arguments are best when they don't come from you. You know, we're all the public health folks. We're, you know, the um, you know, having these arguments come from us is not the best way. They work best when they come from community members and youth, concerned parents or teachers. Um, so again, you know, working on this issue, you know, it'll be really 
easy to reach out to some of the same advocates who've worked on other issues dealing with youth access to tobacco in your campaign. They'll really understand the importance of this issue. You can kind of bridge from the issues you've worked on other flavored tobacco or reducing access for other products. Um, and I think it will be really clear to them why this issue is really important. So just making sure that you're reaching back out to them and that they're the ones bringing that message, that it's not just coming from the public health folks. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jack, and I look, really look forward to seeing everybody take action on these new products moving forward. Jack? Okay. Thanks, Vanessa. And here are some resources available from the Center on these issues, and you can always go to um, our website and download those at any time. And then finally, the, uh, as the Change Lab folks um, always describe it, the fine print that any information provided in this discussion is not legal advice. So pay attention to that. Now since we have like a, just a few minutes left, uh, I was thinking that there were some I issues that had popped up on the, in the chat box that might be interesting for us to respond to. So if all the presenters could um, uh, pay attention just for a moment here on this. First of all, uh, Vermont and New York, uh, we were informed on the chat box, uh, have passed laws which restrict uh, e-cigarette sales to adults. So congratulations uh, to those of you from Vermont and New York on the call. And then um, I know, Catherine, you've been responding to some of the uh, notes on the chat box about uh, the legal explaining the legality of selling FDA products, but maybe for the benefit of everybody on the call you could do that. Sure, Jack. So, um, as it is right now, minors cannot purchase FDA-approved cessation devices like the patch or Nicorette unless they have a prescription from their doctor. So there is this precedent for restricting the age um, uh, for sales of these nicotine-only products. I hope that clears that up. I also wanted to add that, um, yes, it, it looks like uh, New York and Vermont have both passed uh, sales restrictions very recently, and the New York law will go into effect actually January 1, 2013. Um, and it looks like Utah as well has restrictions. Um, and Utah is one of those special states that actually restricts tobacco products for anyone under the age of, I believe it's 20. So um, in Utah, you cannot buy an e-cigarette unless you are over the age of 20. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, so another idea that I uh, heard on the chat box here, or at least saw on the chat box, was the idea of uh, a policy which bans the introduction of any new uh, tobacco products, kind of a, a moratorium that give to, gives the decision makers an opportunity to review all these things and, and, um, and decide on them. So the notion of a moratorium, is that, is that uh, been done anywhere, uh, or is it legal? Who would like to grab that one? I'm, Matthew, I'll let you chime in. But as far as I know, um, that hasn't been done anywhere. I'd love to hear from people in the chat box if you know otherwise. Uh, but there's uh, no reason to think that it's not a legal option. Um, so that is certainly a strategy that is out there and available if people are interested in pursuing it. Matthew, any thoughts? No, I think that's right. Okay. Well, um, and there's some other uh, items being thrown up in the chat box already as we're talking. So, uh, you know, we'll, we will try to respond to all of these uh, as we can on an offline basis. And uh, just to remind ourselves how important this topic is, uh, I think I saw a top. Uh, total of 281 people on this call you know, from um, nearly 30 states. So this is clearly something that we're all thinking about, all trying to figure out how to address. And um, you know, I really ap appreciate everybody being on the call. Now, without attempting to sum it all up, uh, I'll end with this thought. Uh, no victory that we win against the tobacco industry is, is ever permanent. If they're not trying to repeal our past victories, uh, they're finding ways to get around them. 
So our mission requires constant vigilance. These emerging products, tobacco and nicotine-based products, are the most recent counterattack by the tobacco companies on our success. We simply must meet these guys head-on on these products, get these products on our public health agenda and on the agendas of local and state government so we can do it. And thanks again for joining the webinar. Now, when you sign off, there's going to be a little Survey Monkey questionnaire that uh, pops up. It, it's only about five questions. Uh, please fill it out, and it'll be very helpful to us in the in the, uh, for us in the future. So thanks again uh, very much, and goodbye for now. <laughs>